acknowledge um, that I'm like preternaturally, unnaturally, unusually for me nervous about this presentation. In part, I want to acknowledge this because I deal a lot with affect and I'm sort of interested in affect and technology and performance and like what performance does around affect and how we know. And part of the reason that I'm sort of unusually anxious is that we're going to have this kind of haptic performance thing go on here. And this is super experimental, so I, I hope it goes okay. But I also, um, I feel a little bit of a burden, and I just want to acknowledge that the stuff that I'm about to talk about is hard, right? The, it carries a lot of weight. And part of what I'm going to talk about in terms of <clears throat> sonifying, that is turning data into sound, and haptifying, turning it into tactile experience, especially when you're talking about the forced or coerced sterilization of people, um, is heavy, right? And part of why we're interested in this, my collaborators and I, is it's affective power, but I also want to acknowledge that it has a lot of power. So if anybody feels like they don't want to come up and touch the things when they start vibrating, I will totally understand. If you feel like you want to like not listen and step out of the room, I totally understand. I just want to make space for acknowledging that. I'm also going to grab my water because I get terrible dry mouth from talking. Thank you. Alexandra and her team at Michigan have done 
a unique resource of 18,000 patient records from California institutions from 1921 to 1953. These records were microfilmed by the California Department of State Hospitals in the 1970s and then largely abandoned. They were found in a filing cabinet in an abandoned um, building. <clears throat> Alexander Ashley is the one who found them. And she and her team have been uh, digitizing these reels and are using them uh, in compliance with state and university regulations to create what's known as a de-identified data set. Our database includes patient records that include 212 variables pulled from over 30,000 unique documents. This resource is the first of its kind, encompassing almost one third of the total sterilizations performed in the 32 states in the US in the 20th century. Now part <clears throat> of the challenge of exposing these histories is a set of national guidelines regarding the release of medical data, which is considered protected information. And this brings us back to our sort of theme of open access versus privacy, right? The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, was designated in part to protect the confidentiality and security of healthcare information. But the law is also, in this case in particular, a tool to obscure histories and contemporary accounts of reproductive discrimination and human rights violations. Now, violations of human rights in the areas of reproduction and health, particularly of vulnerable, often minority populations in the United States, is not new. But these practices remain largely out of public view until investigative journalists and community activists are able to break through the silence. And this is largely because of the HIPAA laws. Thus far, traditional scholarly work with protected information has sought to create what are known as composite models in order to tell stories of injustice without violating privacy. Now these models, while useful, have you know, the sort of undesired effect of reducing individual experience to a kind of false collective imagined experience, and they really lack the kind of um, resonance needed to transform public awareness and policy making. Now I joined Alexander on this project just this year, uh, or last year actually, I guess, we were at a conference together and sort of decided that we were gonna start working together and Part of what happened was that I had already been thinking about performance as a useful way of thinking about how archives are activated and activatable. Um, and I had been thinking with um, Morris Eves, right, and his piece, uh, The Editorial Boy, toward a note, Notes Toward a Study of Oblivion. Um, and he has this, this kind of, um, this observation about the, the what do I want to call it, like the, the human scale, right, of our own memory, right? Given the dispersal and disposal of the normal fate of information, when it hits a generational border, so there's a kind of generational effect in our, in our knowledge making. Um, and he's citing gaps. He's particularly interested in the set of gaps around um, some, some images. Um, but I think his idea of how, like, how might we edit the missing? Like, how do we think about editing in order to create the space to acknowledge those who are missing in archives is a really compelling one. Now, when I heard Alexander first talk about the eugenics project, it really pushed me to think hard about the intellectual underpinnings of my own sense of melancholy regarding archival absence. I often sort of lament it, want to stomp my feet, feel bad about it, etc. Um, and I began looking for ways to think not only in terms of loss and lossiness, but also in terms of possibility and opportunity. A kind of methodological equivalent of highlighting what is there rather than stomping my feet and protesting, but, but nothing's there. Um, and in the context of, and I'm trained as an early modernist, so I keep referencing people who do ye holy things, um, but in the context of Shakespeare studies, Simon Palfrey has recently suggested thinking about literary and historical records in terms of fractals. And I just want to put a pin in the fact that uh, Paul Frey's not the first one to do this. Waichi Demick did a really great job of this um, in her wonderful 2006 Other Contents. Um, but he is particularly quotable. He suggests thinking of the fractal nature of the archival record as, in one sense, an insufficient shard of the true substance, and in another sense, a promise crammed instantiation of everything. Right? And I think that tension between insufficiency and promise crammed instantiation is really um, interesting. It's a kind of um, productive site of uh, possibility even as we acknowledge absence. And I think it's also a way of sort of subverting the melancholic notion of archival loss and absence, a way for me of seeing discussions of privacy uh, and 
the right to be forgotten might bear on non 20th century archives. But it's also a way of thinking about those tiny little shards of HIPAA compliant de identified data as really rich rather than just really lacking. At the same time, <clears throat> I was thinking about performance theory through Rebecca Schneider in part to push back against, and I'm quoting her here, the long-standing assumption in archive culture that objects, documents, and recordings are the only way of remaining, and this goes, I think, in part to some of the stuff that you were talking about earlier with the different like, non-textual forms of memory making that we have, um, and that monuments are the best mode of commemorating. So Schneider is really pushing hard against a kind of monumental mode. And she is thinking of a kind of performance-based archival theory that pushes back not only on a monumental mode, but one that is imperial and patriarchal in its logics. One that assumes that if it is not visible or given to documentation or otherwise houseable, to use Derrida's phrase, um, under house arrest, I think it's really striking that he uses that, that way of uh, talking about it, that an archive is somehow lost or disappeared. And Schneider quotes uh, Diana Taylor, saying there's an advantage to thinking about a repertoire performed through dance, theater, song, ritual, witnessing, healing practices, memory paths, and the many other forms of repeatable behaviors as something that cannot be housed or contained in the traditional archive. So what I'd like to do now uh, is take a, a turn to an example of a, of a kind of performative gesture, a very first and very prototype sort of first generation style effort at enacting the kind of practice that I hear Schneider and Taylor suggesting. And as I said, um, this is just a very small part of the, the work that I'm doing, um, not only with Alexandra Stern, but with my collaborators, Jessica Rajko and Eileen Stanley. Um, and if you're interested in the Vibrant Lives project, we have a website, you can check it out, it's vibrantlives.wordpress.com. Um, and what we're doing in there, and this sort of brings the Stern the Michigan and the ASU collaborations together is to think about how we can know through our skin and our ears what haptic and sonic knowledge might do for us. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play you a, a small sample. This is, as I said, a, a sort of test sample. This um, is a map right here, which you see is a visual map of a sonified sterilization. This is a random selection of 100 files from the first two years of data. Um, and what you have is I've mapped the data points into space somewhat arbitrarily in order to optimize being able to hear the difference. So men who consent are given the value of 75. That is, they are sterilized with some sort of consent. Women who consent, or sorry, men who consent are 51. Women who consent are 75. Men without consent are 250. And women without consent are 300. So if you'll just take a minute. And if anybody, as I said, needs to not do this, that's okay with me too. Now would be the time to head out of the room. <laughs> Right, deal with tactile experience that are about knowing through touch or skin. 
And what I have over here are two woojers, which are essentially personal subwoofers. Can I have two volunteers, one who would sort of stand roughly here and one who would stand roughly there? All right, so my two volunteer people, please come and get a, a coat hanger. <laughs> I need one more volunteer. Here, I'll help you. Thank you. So the idea, I need you to stand back far enough that the, the red wire is taut. And actually, if you could not go up on that stage, because people need to come and touch this. OK. So now I'm going to ask those of you who want to be able to feel the vibrations of that data set to come up and sort of arrange yourselves around these two lines.
um, as responsible for the kinds of knowledge and subject positions that our efforts engender. And um, I just want to I'll, I'll sort of end by pinging that um, I think this is a sort of interesting way of thinking of um, Schneider's notion of syncopated time, um, something like Toni Morrison's Rememory, Adrienne Rich's Revision, um, other kinds of modes that think about engaging with archives differently. And going forward, we have a set of questions for ourselves in the project, so like what, what are the ethical considerations that we have overlooked? Um, what is it, how can we best care for the bodies, right? Both the bodies that, that were harmed, right? But also the body of records while staying inside this sort of um, encapsulation of the law, but also your bodies, right? Because I just involved you in a participatory experience in which I asked you to touch a representation of history in some way, and I think that, that carries a certain kind of weight. So I'll go ahead and end there. Thank you very much. To me, feels very appropriative. 
um, which is part of why I like this sonification, because it creates a certain kind of distance, um, such that I'm not appropriating people who were, who were damaged, essentially. Um, that said, you know, part of the reason the composite model is so unsatisfying is because it doesn't resonate, right? And I, and I don't know, I'm actually really interested to hear you guys whether or not this was meaningful for you as a sort of experience of this data. Um, because it might be that this is just too abstracted, right? That, that you want the words. Um, but I think there's a real problem with the words in that the person can be re-identified, right? And so there's a privacy issue. But also, who am I to, to, to out them in, in a particular way? And at the same time, I think these records and this history of the, the state practices have been obscured because because of privacy concerns, right? So the majority of people don't know that 64,000 people were sterilized in the US, um, that it was disproportionately people of color. Depending on which time and space you were looking at, it was often immigrant women, Catholic women, including Irish women. Um, but here in this particular data, data set, the early data set, it was men. Um, you know, so I think it's super complicated is where I fall in it. Um, and I'm still trying to find my way. I, I'd like to know how many people in the room who experienced both felt that if we had no context for some our feeling, we would have thought we had participated in an art performance. If you had not told us what this was supposed to be about, it is abstract. Um, and that raises some other issues about whether or not you're being very personal with it in forthcoming. But other people might use archives and start producing art and they do. out of tragic events. They do. And not allowing other people to know that's where it came from. I mean, I think that's a real issue, and, and people do that. I don't know how people felt in the room, but I, I know there was another question. So, so my, so my question is, this is going to sound sort of crude, and I don't mean it to be. Okay. But I think privacy rights stop at death. They, they don't. We don't have a right to be forgotten per se. And I'm not positive what the finer points of HIPAA are. And I was just wondering if you've looked at that and if that came into consideration. I don't, again, mean to be crude. No. But I also, on a side point, I appreciate your being restrained because you can use sound to evoke all kinds of emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, the human is very uh, hackable uh, through the sensory mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And we know a lot about how to do that. And I like that you didn't actually you know, create dread mm -hmm. in, a, in a sonic way. Mm -hmm. yeah, I appreciate that feedback. Um, in terms of HIPAA regulations, so there was a, an update. Uh, I think this is back here. It's kind of small text. Um, oh, no, it's actually not on that slide. Um, there was an update that said that HIPAA regulations are enforced until 50 years after the death of the person. Now, that is also different. So that's the national guidelines. It is differentially applied in different archives. So different archives with the same data set have said variously 50 years, 100 years, never. So the state of Arizona, for example, will not give me access to those records unless I can tell them the name of every individual's record that I want to look at so that they can verify that that human has been dead for the, pre the prerequisite number of years. So I functionally can't get that record. Right? And in the case of um, the scholar who worked on these uh, in, uh, for North Carolina, the state destroyed the records when they found out what she was doing. And the only reason we have that record is because she photocopied it and took it home. Right? So um, the, the, the like, meta-theoretical issues of privacy, I think, are, are there and real. Um, but there's also this way in which particular archives, particular states are implementing restrictions that are making it impossible to get this data or this, these histories out, regardless of what the law says, which is super frustrating.
this was a really interesting presentation. And I think that the multimodal experience of this kind of archive seems really fitting in part because it's almost like you're um, demonstrating the agency of people whose agency was taken away. Mm -hmm. And I was curious if you could comment on that reading of this kind of performative archive and also on the applicability of this kind of multimodal experience to other kinds of archives. Maybe that's not so strongly at play. Um, I mean, I think, you know, sonification uh, and haptification, I think, are, are really interesting. The more we know about the science of sort of like how the body is hackable, right, how we come to know things, I think multi multimodality of this kind is an area that deserves to be explored much more, right? Um, I think uh, in terms of agency, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting question, right? Because I struggle with what it means to give someone voice, right? That's a, a, a really typical phrase in like old school recovery projects. And yet it can have this really appropriative quality, especially when, you know, I'm a white academic in a relatively reasonably privileged position, right? And um, so there's a way for me, I, I, I keep thinking about being haunted. Uh, this came up last night at dinner, um, but I mean it a little differently than the ghost hunters. Um, being haunted by things that I find in the archive. And I think one of the things that's interesting for me about the sonic and the haptic is the way that it, it doesn't try to literalize voice, but it still gives experience. Um, and, and that experience then might linger with someone, it might haunt them in really productive ways. So I think there's a lot to do there, and, and that's sort of how I've been thinking about it. Yeah, of course. Um, I would really love feedback, since this is in a super early stage. So if you would email me or tweet at, uh, at Prof. Um, that would be, or even just on the hashtag for the conference, that would be super great. Any feedback, I'm, I'm open to all of it. Thanks.